thousand some people, and then we will go with that, okay? So, we have fun. This is a small group, and the, the whole point for this whole is, I suppose, that you have faculty come from different parts of the world. For me, for example, I come from Stanford in the United States. So you want to get to know the faculty and you want to have good interaction. There's no wrong or right answer or question here, so we just work together. And you really want to interact and you want to, 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 to get to know it, okay? So feel free to ask questions for that aspect. My task this morning is to discuss with you on retinal vasculitis. So how many of you in the audience have seen retinal vasculitis already? Only one? No, few. Okay. So the last case of vasculitis that you saw, what was the cause of that? Well, I just saw it this morning. It was, uh, okay. I'm sorry? <laughs> leukemia. Okay, so that's great. You saw one this morning. That's good. So that's what I'm saying. So this is a condition that definitely uh, can lead to significant visual loss. And for me, it's quite interesting because this is another part, although only a very small part of the, if we have systemic association, we will see some of that here. The disclosure of that is, uh, you can see it here, our university has received research funding from a number of sources, and so I have been helping with some of the research projects here. So retinal vasculitis, it can be vision threatening. Suddenly, this is when, for example, the macula is involved, that definitely can drop away your vision aspect for it. A lot of the time, we think of it as inflammatory cause because due to this aspect, and it's involved the blood vessels, uh, the artery in the vein. Which one tends to affect more, is it the vein or the artery? Vein, okay, so phlebitis, periphibitis is the one that comes with that. And what's most interesting to many of us in this field is that it, it can be associated with a hidden illness underground, and that's what we try to figure out with this aspect from there. So, a patient with erectile vasculitis can also be asymptomatic, for example, because of the peripheral retina involvement, there have not been anything of that nature. The loss of vision, why would they have loss of vision, painless loss of vision? What does that tell you? <coughs> I'm sorry? Ischemia. I what? Ischemia. I'd say ischemia. And usually what type of, of vessel that will lead to loss of vision here? So, for example, if you get like, for example, a vein occlusion or arterial occlusion, right? So there will be pain or loss of vision with this aspect and it can definitely affect with this aspect from there. What about floater? Why would a patient with retinal vascular just have floaters? I'm sorry? Hemorrhage, exactly. So vitreous hemorrhage uh, uh, could also be like that, or they also have vitreous cells in there that can only lead to that. And of course, the scotoma, this aspect that would lead to, because of the infarction, this aspect here. And then when they have associated aerocyclitis in the front part of the eye, then typically they, they will also present with what we see as a similar aspect with anterior uveitis, and so therefore you will have pain and redness here. So let's start with this case here. This is a very memorable case that I came across even during my time of fellowship here. So this is the 34 years old man who presented with floater for several months, no known medical history, and the father has scleroderma and diaphragmic complication. On the review of system, because as you know, many times when we see U.S. patient, we ask them to fill out a complete survey questionnaire while waiting for us, and they come back with a lot of things that help us to then guide out, out what we want to do. So in this review system, we have stiff finger in rainy cold weather cram in the legs, and intimate loss of balance. Okay, so that's what they fill out in the, the questionnaire for that. So keep that in mind with this aspect from that. Now, on examination, is 2050 and 2040 in the eye. This is the finding in here. The, the segment is very much clear with no in, uh, um, reaction there. This is the fungus. So someone would like to discuss for me how about we have this tube out in this fungus. What do you see there? Okay. Uh, are you certain that this are exudate? Okay, how do you just certain that this is exudate? What other thing can be in this white spot here? I'm sorry? Louder. Cotton wound spot. So what's the difference between cotton wound spot and exudate? Your colleague over here, and by the way, where are you from? Indonesia. Indonesia, perfect. So you, the Indonesia, Indonesia team think that this is uh, exudate, and the team over here think that this is cotton wound spot. So what's the difference? In front of what? The no fiber layer, so it's much more superficial. The exit is usually deeper. So if you come actually closer here, these are much more superficial. So these are actually cotton bone spots. So a uh, cotton bone spot in function of the no fiber layer can be a non specific sign, right? So what other disease that you can see a uh, cotton bone spot in? Most common one diabetic retinopathy or hypertensive retinopathy, right? So that's what you see here. But you also see some of these things here. So you see that, and you see this aspect from there. And so that's the fungus. And the left eye is, I'm sorry, the right eyes also have similar findings at this as well for this part. So in looking at patients with, with um, 
potential problem with the vessel in here. So what we do, we look at the, the questionnaire, we see that, we do this, we look at the fundus, and we see this aspect. So now, typically what we do is we will do flow scene angiography, right? So look for the vessel. So if we do the flow scene angiography, then what do you see here? Leakage. Leakage of what? Uh, from the vessel. Is it the artery or the vein? Vein, right? So this is a small vessel, but you can really see the vessel in here. And it's, it's, it's not, nowadays, uh, many times we see, for example, in a wide angle uh, photograph and flow scene. For example, many of you here have seen wide angle photography, right? For example, in the Optos model, P200, you see in the peripheral retina, and you can see leakage out there. And sometimes we wonder about the value of when we see leakage, but that in the periphery. When we see leakage in the posterior pole like this, this is an important point, so we have to be considered that this is a important. So we see some leakage of this aspect from here. So now with that, and so do people, can people put together so far what this may be? So this is a young man, no medical history, have some symptom on the questionnaire. This is the finding. What question do you like to ask me now? Louder? Any oral ulcer? That's an excellent question. So this this colleague is thinking of what? Yes. Michelle. So this patient have no oral ulcer. Okay, there's no oral ulcer. But that's an excellent question. That's a very important point. What else? Why would the person have intermittent loss of balance? What part of the brain is involved when you have balance loss? Cerebellum. So that being this the vessel in there, right? So there's possibly vasculitis in the brain as well. So if we were telling you that this is the laboratory evaluation. Am I overdone it, or this is the appropriate way to do this? What am I missing in here? So this is the lack of evaluation so far in this aspect from this patient, based on the review system. So the ANA is 10640, which is a quite high titer. Okay. Now, why am I testing for anti-double-stranded DNA? What am I worried about? SME. So that's the aspect from there. What about the complement level? Why do I look at complement level? So, what are the two conditions that usually consuming uh, complement? What are the two most common complement consuming disease? One is SLE. What's the second one? Wagner would be the other one. Okay, so those are the two. When I say that, I mean is that if you see those things low, you should expect them. If you treat them, the, the, the value will come back to me no more again for this aspect in here. And C-reactive protein is what I want to see whether the process is involved, just the IO or systemically involved in this case is, is more. So now, if with this type of picture, with that type of finding, what am I missing in here to make the diagnosis? Anchor. I'm sorry? Anchor. Anchor. So you, you want to say anchor. Okay, so let's say if I get here an anchor that is positive, then what will you do? Okay, so let's say anchor positive. Right now, right now, on the finding I have here, what is it consistent with? Uh, SLE. SLE, right? So SLE requires how many criteria to make the diagnosis? So out of 11, how many do we need? Four, right? So we need four of them, correct? So the lab which you're testing is one of them, the, the, the percent, that one of them, the symptom of the patient, right? So we also need to have some other laboratory finding in here. And what is another thing that is missing in here? What is what is the most uh, what is the other common organ in patient with SLE that involved? Which one? Kidney. Kidney, exactly. So what am I missing? So renal function, but more importantly, so before you see creatinine start to drop down, you see things change before that, right? Because by the time creatinine drops, the, the kidney already damaged already. So the thing that goes faster than that would be protein urea. You see protein in the, in, the, in the urine. That comes much faster. So that's the reason why we check the next part of here is the protein, because it comes faster. Even if when you have, that's why you, you do a UA and you see some spill of protein and you move forward with that. So this patient now have the protein urea, that's the organ, they have the nucleic antibody and move on forward. He ended up getting an MRI which showed the uh, involvement of the vessel in the brain as well. So he met the criteria with the, with the aspect from there. So the diagnosis that we make here was this is a case of the SLE with nephropathy, the CNS uh, vasculitis, the retinopathy, and the retinovasculitis. So, so that's how we make this diagnosis based on that. Now, is the eye finding one of the 11 criteria for SLE? Yes or no? No. 
Okay, so unfortunately, the I finding is not part of the 11 criteria that we test that, that, that is positive for SLE. So therefore, we are having this aspect from there that we would say that, that unfortunately, sometimes we have to discuss with the rheumatologist to get them to move forward and then to, to agree with us because unfortunately, in that, um, the American College of Rheumatology report, they don't include that in this aspect. But this is a case where, this is a real case that I come to remember every time I think of this thing. This is a patient that comes up very much with no medical history before. And this is a case where the eye finding had led to the, this, this, um, this uh, diagnosis of SLE. And when we look at back in the literature, it's about 6%. So about 6% of the time, the eye finding will be the first finding that we notice in SLE patient. So this is a case in here. So for this aspect from here, we managed him in this aspect from here. So the best 30 treatment at, that, at least at that time of day would be to use a cytotoxic agent like cyclophosphamide, which is a um, uh, which is alkylating agent to do with this aspect. And of course, as you can see in there, this is a very toxic medication, especially with the reproductive system. So hence, we did discuss and we did bang uh, his spoon because as we know, so what can cyclophosphamide do to your reproductive organ? So it will, what does cyclophosphamide and the alkylating agent, what they would do is they would shut down, they basically damage the egg and would decrease the sperm production for that. And that's the real. So anytime that you plan to use that for more than 12 months or so, you definitely should get them stored that because that's a real serious problem and we don't want to induce another problem for our patient with that. So that's how we treat it. However, in the literature, the use of a uh, alkylating agent like cyclophosphamide helps significantly to save the kidney, and hence that's the reason why we, we diagnose with SRV and we treat with that. That's very important to do with that. Right. And then we maintain the patient, we will talk in a second, with hydroxychloroquine or black corneal, as well as a type and followed by that. So the clinical course of this patient did quite well uh, after two years or so, a day about 2030 OU, and no progression of the nephropathy or the, neuro, um, or the uh, retinopathy, which is an excellent point. Okay, so this is a case where we illustrate the, how we use the concept we know. Again, we don't have any finding like that in the beginning. We don't, the patient did not come in with that diagnosis, so it's helped that we start asking the question. And um, Dr. Jim Rosenbaum from Portland, Oregon, have done a study. The, the association with systemic disease is actually low, it's so less than 20% with retinal vasculitis. But when you have able to do that, you actually have to save the patient in many different ways. So you, therefore, you definitely need to work up the patient to decode this code, that's aspect. So now when we look at patient with retinal vasculitis, we look at the ocular finding, and we look at both the anterior aspect, which that can include anterior uveitis, and then the posterior aspect from that. So this is how I break it down. Retinal vasculitis can associate with different things, either the anterior uveitis or the posterior uveitis. So anterior uveitis like that, if you see some of uh, the, the white material there, so this is, will be a what? This will be a hypopian, right? So if you see an anterior uveitis for hypopian, what are the two most common diagnoses that you think of? The shed is one, what's the second one? B27, right? So those are the two things that commonly produce the, the hypopian, at least in a few of uveitis. So one if they check, the other one is B27. And so if you think of that, then it's definitely help you to do that aspect. For the posterior uveitis, you have a number of findings that you can see depending on what stage the patient has had, either sheathing or nevascularization or hemorrhages or sclerotic vessel, different part of that will go from there that you see in there. But that's what you try to put together. So regarding the etiology of this aspect, I like to think of, of, of retinal vasculitis just like when you, when you look at various type of posterior uveitis, for example, I like to think of it as an infectious type, uh, which you here you will be hearing very shortly from um, Dr. Gupta as well, so then you think of non-infectious uveitis, but then have a systemic disorder associated with it, and then you can have the non-infectious uveitis that just limit down to the eye only. So if you put yourself in one of this uh, uh, category, then it can help you to think where we're going with this direction. So for infectious uveitis, on the right hand side here, you see a number of potential infectious uveitis causing from there, from acute retinal necrosis to syphilis, to toxoplasmosis, and then on the left hand side, there's a picture. So this is a picture of a patient. First of all, when you look at this picture, what happened to the optic nerve here? It's just falling, right? And what happened between, if you were to walk from the optic nerve to the macular area, what do you see? What do you see there? You will see exudate there, right? So you see exudate this aspect. So this is a description of what? How do you describe it? When you see this picture, let's say, I don't know of other countries, but let's just say you're in an oral board exam, and the examiner gives you this picture and asks you, 
Doctor, what are the different two diagnoses? And first of all, what are you seeing here? Neuroretinitis, exactly. So the only different two diagnoses is neuroretinitis. The most common one is what? Cash fat, not lung. Cash fat. What's the sex? What's another one? Toxo does not produce the neuroretinitis. They have a lesion. They, they they produce the optic nerve inflammation, but not so often the neuroretinitis like this. So the other one common one would be syphilis. Okay, so syphilis will be another one. This aspect, especially if you see the sheathing of the vessel outside here. So this is a case uh, again. Uh, ophthalmology, we're very fortunate because we often ask to see things and then we make the diagnosis from that. So if you want, by the time that you come up with the term neuroretinitis, then you will be able to see that it's very clear that this is what is being affected and then you see what can cause with that. So that here, this is a case of syphilis. So this is infectious. So now you move to the next category, which is non-infectious uveitis that have a systemic disorder associated with this. So on the right, left hand side, you see a number of conditions that potentially can cause this. And then again, this is the case, this is so a fluorescent angiography of this. So among everything I list on the left-hand side, what was the most common non-infectious uveitis that have systemic disorder that in general we should think of when we look at cases of posterior uveitis? There are two things, what I learned in medical school is that when there are two type of diagnosis that no matter what organ you in the body, whether the heart or the brain or the eye, if you put in a different diagnosis, no one can say that it's not possible. So you can always get it right because they can always happen because so why? So one of them I already mentioned to the syphilis. So if you put syphilis in different diagnosis, you go think of what you went to medical school, anything can be caused by syphilis. So that's a good one to put. No one can ever claim that you don't have that. What's the second one? Sarcoid. So that's another one in there. So sarcoid is another one that have multi-organ involvement in this aspect. So therefore, you can put it on there. So this is a case of sarcoid involvement, this aspect from there, that showed the linkage peripheritis. And if you look at it as a textbook, when they talk about this, you would do that. Now, that would be of that nature. But of course, you have to put into the context. If you, for example, have a colleague present a case from India, like our two um, professors in the back there, then you have to think of something else more than that, just this aspect, right? So if it's, it's a case like that, then you have to think of some more infectious ideology uh, situation, for example, with tuberculosis, that would be a case. But in the general, what you think is that you think of other conditions that can cause for that. So this is systemic order. Okay. So let's go on with another case. So this patient is 24 years old Caucasian man who present with loss of vision for four days. As you can see, there are 20, 30, and 2200. This is his eye. Okay. So looking at this left eye here, how long do you think this process has been going on? Four days a week? Longer. How do, you, how do you know it's longer? Fibrosis, exactly. So if you look carefully at the optic nerve, you only see fibrosis. Fibrosis does not occur within a few days or a week. So this takes months of it. So why would the patient just have suddenly have loss of vision for four days now? I'm sorry? Macular involvement, right? So now the X-ray is involved in that one. That's why you have lost. But from what you can see in there, this process is not new. So it's been in there for a while in this aspect here. So this is this patient in this aspect. And this is the flow scene which shows the leakage in this aspect. So what else you want to know about this patient? 24 year old man, just like the first patient, coming with no previous diagnosis. Diabetes, no. Because diabetes you would have seen other aspects, right, under retina. So diabetic retinopathy present with microaneurysm with other aspects. So you will see much hemorrhage in there. But definitely, the nerve can be that of the diabetic retinopathy, but not the outside part of it. What other question do you want me to ask? To ask me. I'm sorry? The other eye. Louder? What is the other eye? Look what the other eye? The other eye, uh, look, they have some exudate, but not involved in the macro like this yet. So that's why the vision is still 20, 30 in the other eye. But it's a bilateral process, it's asymmetric, so it's not the same. Okay, so you go to the symptom, and this I show the next picture, it's very easy. By the time you take the next picture, you ask the patient, and one of those, um, our question has about 100 questions on it, so by the time you look at that, the patient complain, and you see this picture, you will know the diagnosis, is right? So when I'm shown like this, so exactly this is the case in there, and is the ulcer in project painful or painless? Painful. That's one of the hallmarks of the chancre ulcer in, 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 in project. It's very painful with that. 
And patients usually, you see the list, they are on something called um, viscous lidocaine, so that can help to control the pain in there. So this is the diagnosis of this. And again, this patient have had this diagnosis, but have not been put together now into the eye with loss. So the diagnosis of the jet disease was made with this patient, and the patient moved forward to be treated. Again, I'm picking out, obviously, the cases I have learned to my career that have helped me with this thing from there. But certainly, you keep this in mind. I would say that uh, four out of the five cases that you will see would not have an underlying systemic disease. But for the one cases that you have, it's definitely helpful you can help me with that aspect. Yes? Is there anything in that retinal picture that would prompt you to think that this patient is even before the cancer So, in general, when the optic nerve is involved, it definitely that part of that thing because if you think of how patients with project lose the vision either from the occlusive vice that they have or of the optic nerve become involved and become pallid. So that would depart from there. And beyond that, again, the, just the history. So all of us who do UVI, this rely a lot on the patient history. And something like this, the patient will tell you, the, I am really well, the only thing that bothers me is my mouth. It's quite painful. And then you ask them to open and you, you look at them and now that you, set, you use your iPhone, you take some picture. And then you can tell that that is the painful that aspect. Okay. Yes, sir. Can I just ask for the oral ulcers in patients? Um, do you normally get multiple, or do you only see one? And when you talk about the pain, is there any kind of characteristic? M meaning that if you touch it, it's painful, or is it painful non-stop? Yes, so it's painful. So the separate, you can have either one focus uh, or, or several full side of it. So oftentimes you have to distinguish between that and the herpetic ulcer that people have from the oral ulcer too. The other one they bother, but they're not painful. This one, when the, the ulcer is there, they will complain to you. They will tell you that it's quite painful from that. So the painful, the, I'm sorry, the, uh, the, the pain from the oral ulcer in the chest is quite distinctive in there. And that's obviously, you know, that's one of the major criteria to make the diagnosis of the chest in that aspect and, from the and, and are the ulcers, do they keep coming? I, I mean, are there periods when it's there and not there, or is it always there? As no, as, as no, it's on and off. So that's what you can control, for example, like, so some of them you can, you maintain them with let's say cochicine or that something control over time you control. Um, didn't break yet, so it's okay. <laughs> and so um, and so yeah, but it's not constant. So it depends on how well you maintain that in this aspect. Okay. So the next category would be the non-infectious event is with just ocular disorder alone. Okay, so here on the left hand side, you see this is a condition that in general are limited to the eye only and have this aspect. For example, birdshot is one of those where we know there's bilateral disease in general and it has this part, but it does not affect the system organ in there. So now, this is a patient that has, uh, you can see from there from the, the photograph, there's some hemorrhage that's present, is that correct? So the hemorrhage is present in there, and you also see uh, the, the, the uh, aspect from this aspect uh, from the eye there, perhaps one of the hallmark of this disease, can someone recognize this in the diagnosis right away for one of the choices I have in the left? Okay, what, okay so if you look at the, the, the common on the, the left-hand side, right, the thing that can lead to hemorrhage like this, commonly or few things, for example, ill disease is one of them that can lead to hemorrhage. The second one on that list that will lead to this aspect would be urban, that will lead to that because of the bleeding of that. Postmanitis, if you form neovascularization, then eventually they bleed, but usually no. So what, how many of you in here have seen a case of OVAN? OVAN is a very unique entity. It defines exactly what you just see, that it has retinovasculitis, it has aneurysm, and it has the new retinitis aspect from there. So this is a case of an OVAN that, that we have seen before. And the more unique thing, if you look at the, the publication in OVAN, one of the things you will see is that is very peculiar. Those aneurysm, they jump. In other words, in one visit, you will see them in one area. The next visit, that aneurysm disappears and a new one appears there. So that's the unique feature of this. And this is a kind of, of cases where uh, we have not known much over that in the, in, over the year. We don't really know the aspect. It's more like a, a symptom that you discussed in this aspect from there. Okay? And then some of this the aspect from that we see there. So, so you see this aspect from this aspect from there. Another case with this aspect. It's from here. So what cases is this? Fortune brain angelitis. This is from a seven years old uh, boy. I saw uh, in Baltimore with that see from there. So that's very distinctive. This you cannot miss because it, the finding is quite obvious from this aspect there. Now, this is a case of what? So now you will see the actually I show you that case of the ill right. So this is a case of the aneurysm here, and this is the 
what we just talked before. This is the case of neuroarachnitis, right? So you see the exudate between the optic nerve and the macula. Whenever you see that, that's the diagnosis of the neuroarachnitis here. So you have the neuroarachnitis, you have the aneurysm. So this is the case of Irvan that we see versus the other one, which is the Eurysy, whereby you just only see the, the hemorrhage and the aspect. Here you actually see the aneurysm, but then the next visit, this aneurysm can then jump to a different place if you need to. So that's the aspect there. Okay. Again, we in ophthalmology and this aspect, we use a lot of pattern recognition and we see that and we do it with time. But if you keep that in mind and you see whether or not they make sense and they kept the constellation in there. So for so good, too fast, too slow a pace, right? Grand schedule? Okay, let's move forward. Okay, then we will do that. So this is the case of Irvin in here. So now, drug induced retinovasculitis. Name a drug to me that can do this. Anyone? Okay, so one of them is methamphetamine. So this is very common in that that can induce that. The second one is actually very common. That's rifabutin because of the incidence of TB. It's in front of So that definitely is impossible. The third one is a tricky thing because what is immunoglobulin? IVIG. So what do we use IVIG to treat? Refractory uveitis. Okay, so that's what we use. For example, we use that to treat in cases of um, of very severe uh, sulfur that did not respond to other things. We use that. Sometimes we use IVIG to treat, for example, ocular pemphigoid to treat that. So that is something that actually caused that. And we are now one of the cases that we just published in the American Journal of Ophthalmology case report is a case of a patient who has Kawasaki uh, disease, a boy that has. Um, was treated with IVIG and developed severe retinovasculitis from that. So that's been uh, published in the past literature, but this is a very young patient who does, so we just share that in the literature from there, so that you will see that. So these are the things that you should keep in mind, especially in certain part, like for example, when I was working in Baltimore, a lot of the patients there have exposed themselves to drugs like methamphetamine, so we see this often from there. Okay, so these are some of the aspects from this. So again, when you think of it, in a test or in a round or whatever, don't panic. You just say, okay, this is the case. What are the choices that I have in here? So we heard about whether it's infectious and then non-infectious, right? So you break that to either there's an infection causes or the non-infectious. And then in the non-infectious causes, you say, okay, do this condition associate with a systemic disease or not associate with systemic disease? That helps you to put that in mind. And how do you do that? You do that because you can look to the patient history and you can see if there's any tie to that. And then, of course, when you look at some bizarre thing, then you say, okay, is the patient on any type of drug that can induce this as well? Okay, so that's how you get in there. But in the brown, uh, also in America, we take our oral board after you, you do your residency, you take your written board, and to, to, to be certified, you need oral board. And so in the oral board, ophthalmology is still one of the few last specialties that do that. You come in front of a, an examiner, and he or she will show you a case, and they will ask you to come up with a different diagnosis to do that orally. And the key key is not to panic. You just look at a picture and you say, this could be this. And again, like I say, if you put software, you put surface on there, you always get it right. Because most of the people will say, will, will say that you can you always get involvement in that. Okay? Now, thing that can masquerade the retinovasculitis. So this is the condition that obviously, if you first look at the case of DRVO or CRVO, it's not difficult. You see blood everywhere. So that's not what I meant. What I meant is that after you see that patient, after a while they have resolved, but they left with some sheathing of the blood vessel, that's when you say, okay, could this look like a case of vasculitis before that would be due? Coat disease, the same thing, diabetic retinopathy, the same thing, and some of the sickle cell would be not aspect. So this is the thing that can look like, that can look like a case of vasculitis, but of course when you take more of the history out, then you will be able to, to see that, uh, that, that have a history of that aspect. So to make the diagnosis of this, certainly you've heard me by now, you need a very thorough history to really ask the patient to, to understand that. And then we use the various questionnaire, I was about 100 questions, they fill it out while they're waiting for you, and they help you to direct the medical investigation from this aspect from that. Then the various type of studies is very important for us, for example, flows in angiography. You cannot make the diagnosis of um, vasculitis, retinovasculitis, without having a um, flows in angiography. This is the reason why uh, many of us in the field, you guys, you still do not switch completely over to OCTA. Nowadays, OCTA angiography is getting very popular. You see them do many things. But as you can tell, OCTA angiography, first of all, can only look at the posterior pole in a very small area. 
but they do not show the type of leakage that you want to see in this type of blood. So you want to make sure that, that you do this type of, of, of testing with frozen angiography so that you'll be able to see. This is not something that OCT can pick it up, at least for now, for this aspect. And we definitely want to do that. And also, later on, you may also use that to detect the new vascularization as well from there. And then other type of imaging study, for example, if the rough vascularizer is associated with macular edema, then that's simple. You can see it. You also see it on OCT as well. And then when the eyes have hemorrhages, then ultrasomography is important. Now, the diagnostics testing for this. So the syphilis, as you know by now, that should always, always be done in all cases of uveitis that you will see because then you can have it from the, you know, 15 years old boy to 92 years old woman, you can have syphilis in any of this patient. And a lot of the time in the U.S., we have many people who have been in the service, so they would tell you that, well, when I was in the Army, I used to have syphilis, and they gave me three injections into my buttock. So you say, okay, that was fine, but is that sufficient to treat syphilis? The answer is no. Okay, so by the time that you, if you think that syphilis is involved in the eye, that is tertiary syphilis and that aspect from there. So the three intramuscular injections that they have when they were in the armies or whatever the service, that is not sufficient. So if you think it like that, then you now have to admit them or, or at least you have, get, have them home, do whole intravenous. So you need 14 days of intravenous penicillin in order to control that. So if you have a history that they say they've been treated in the past with intramuscular, that's not sufficient. If you think that the syphilis is now causing the uveitis of that. So you have to, that's why you have to check. And that is very much the standard test that we do with all of our patients in there. Uh, you know, the RPR show that they're very active, but they may not go that. So you always do an RPR and then you do an FTA to see if they have a history of that before. Then the chest x-ray, for several reasons, obviously you want to rule out the, the the uh, higher involvement, but you also want to say that before you begin an inpatient and any type of treatment, you want to make sure that they're healthy, so therefore you want to give them the, the chest x ray to make sure they're good for any type of treatment. Then, HIV testing is very common, so we, because of the protein manifestation of that, we want to make sure that we do that uh, quite often with that, to test them that. The diagnosis test then in there. So, HIV testing is important in some aspect, but only if you think suspect of this aspect from there. So what is the most, what is the most or the highest association between an HLA and a disease that we know of a human disease? I'm sorry? In other words, what of the finding of the HLA typing that have the highest association between the HLA finding and the actual disease? So here's your choices. You have A29, you have B51, and you have B27. What's the answer? I'm sorry, who, say, who says it's B51? We have one hand, okay. Who says it's uh, B27? No hand. So who says it's A29? Okay, you have three hands. So what about all the other hand? You don't have hand or you hand or <laughs> <laughs> what happened? <laughs> so the actual answer is actually A29. You look at that. That is the condition whereby you have the highest, in other words, over 90 plus percent of the patient who have first shot will have, will have the A29 positive. So that's to be, and if you take a board question, that would be in there. That's the highest association is with this first shot, with the A29, okay? So that's that. But you have to see that. You don't just send it to the test when you don't see anything. And of course, the Bechette part, you have also have to find the findings. So that's help you, but not inform you. The caution vascular disease in here, we are, we are, uh, advise our, our resident and fellow, we say, don't order, for example, the ANA and all type of patient. The most common thing we see is that a patient gets referred to us already that the, the, the outside physician did everything from rheumatoid factor to the ANA to everything. And I have to say, I have never found rheumatoid factor to be helpful in anything, but from the outside world, they say that the proper workup without anything, they just go and they do a panel battery test, which is not correct. So you do it, we have to do that. You have to make sure that why you can do that result. So because, at least in the U.S., it's important, you don't want your record or the record of the patient to be less than. So if you happen to do an a ANA on someone that you have no other finding of lupus, you do that. And let's just say the patient come back for whatever reason, a positive of 1 to 80, okay? Or 1 to, one, or, 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 or one to 64 or something like that. That would put, because now, to the layman term, this patient now has autoimmune disease. And what happened? That means that the patient insulin will go up very high, that means that if they lost the one insulin, they will not be able to get again because the insurance people, when they calculate the risk, they say the patient with 
um, autoimmune disease will require a lot of care over time. So to protect the patient with YouTube, you only do the test if you feel that if this test was positive, what are you going to do with it? Does it support your diagnosis or other things? So let's say if the patient has absolutely no other finding whatsoever, then you shouldn't be doing that because then you don't know what to do with this uh, isolated positive AMA. Okay? And if you're going to do an AMA, that means that you're probably thinking about lupus, then you should also do a double strand of DNA because they go together that they want to, want to make the diagnosis together. So that's the part there. That's what we want to do from this part. So invasive diagnosis procedure, as you know in UVI, there's our principle of teaching is that the patient should either get better and resolve. But if you have the patient that keep getting chronic disease that you cannot control, our first principle is that do not just leave it like that. You need to take a step further. And that means you need biopsy, you need tissue diagnosis. So if you have a patient that have chronic inflammation, that's bad. Don't keep it there. You need to move forward and obtain tissue for that. So for the eye, it's a little bit easy. I mean, for the eye, we can get some AC fluid that's easy to get. You can do vitreous uh, inflammation that diagnostic vitrectomy. That's not so difficult either. Then at time when you need to do a retina biopsy, now this is much more complicated, and I would do this when, let's say, one eye is already quite damaged already, and I want to protect the other eye, so I do the biopsy. And if, when you do the biopsy and you see all of this um, the lymphocyte, the, the blue cell here, cling onto the vessel, this is, uh, this is clearly a diagnosis of pathological diagnosis of uh, retinal vasculitis, when you have so much cell cling onto that. Now, oftentimes, we don't have this luxury because we don't typically remove tissue from the eye, the retina from not the test foot, so we often do not have this. So we use a clinical diagnosis, but if you were to do this and you see this finding, it would be a pathological diagnosis from there. There. So, so far, so good? Yes? Now, we move forward to therapy, okay? So we deal with so far, we think how to rectal disease, what to consider for the diagnosis, and now we go to the next step. As clinician, we need to treat the patient. So the therapy for this can include medical therapy, in which case you can do both for infectious and non-infectious causes. You have local ocular therapy, in which case you have supplement systemic treatment to do that, and you have surgical therapy to control the hemorrhage and the retinal detachment for that. So medical therapy, if it's an infectious, that's very easy. If you know that the patient has syphilis causing the retinal vasculitis, you use the anti-infectious treatment, perfect. That would be good, so you go to that and you treat that, and after 14 days or 21 days of penicillin, it's gone. After six months of anti-TB medication, the patient should not have recurrence once anymore, so that's simple. When you have non-infectious vasculitis, you often use the steroid, you can also use the immunomodulator, and of course you then use all the biologics as well. So those are your, your options. And oftentimes on the right hand side, you need more than one to control it and to maintain the patient disease-free status. The medical therapy for that for steroid, when I have vasculitis, especially if it's bilateral vasculitis, I go directly to intravenous steroid, and uh, so I use methoprednisolone. That's very fast. That can control the disease very quickly. That's very good. The other system delivery system is the the uh, register, Which what is the register, by the way? What steroids in the register? Fluoxetine. How about the oxidant? That's the metasol, right? So, so how many of you have seen the register being used here? No. Okay, so register, I hope we will show you later. That register, that particular thing was um, approved in 2005, and basically what it does, it has fluoxetine stay inside that package for about two and a half years. So there from there. Wonderful, wonderful thing to control the inflammation, but what happened? How what? Exactly. So the rate of, of, of uh, intraocular pressure uh, in the elevation is extremely high. Very much 80% of them will have that aspect. So you don't want you want to use it in select cases. And then you have a host of that. So the anti-metabolite T cell and alkylating agent, the anti-metabolite overall is used to maintain. I do not use it to purely control because it's not fast enough. The T cell inhibitor again to do to control the over maintenance. The alkylating agent, yes, you can control it very fast. But you need, but it has side effect to go with that. So the other aspect we use is the um, the biologic. So biologic has obviously become very common over the last few years or so. We have two TNF alpha inhibitors that we use, uh, infliximab or adalimumab. How many of you have here have experience with either one of them? What do you use? Uh, we began with infliximab about two three years ago, and we recently switched to chimera more frequently. Okay, and what country are you from? Uh, Singapore. Ah, okay, so you hear, so, so, so infliximab is definitely something like that between the two. I myself find infliximab, if I have really a few cases of vasculitis or with cerebral vasculitis, we use infliximab more because it's very fast action. 
Uh, in Japan, for example, in this map is actually the first line of therapy for the jet disease over there, from there, so that we use. At the level map, you can use to maintain and control, but it's not, in my experience, it's not that fast enough for that. And then we also have tocilizumab, which we use, but some of our have shown from that aspect. And then rituximab is another one that we use commonly in this aspect. There's a host of other biologics that, that various colleagues have published throughout the year, but these are some of the more common ones that many of us use. The local ocular therapy, again, if you have erythrocyclitis, magnetema, you use steroid, and you either use topical to supplement, not alone, to supplement, you use the periocular, or you use the intravitreal implant, as I mentioned, the red suit or the oxidax that for for teacher, and then if you have retinal uh, ischemia with revascularization, then you treat it just like a patient with uh, diabetic retinopathy, in which if you use PRP to control that aspect from there to help out with that. Again, use the principle we don't hear. We are we already use the underlying treatment to treat the root cause, and we use some of this aspect, let's say PRP, to deal with the complication that result from that. So this is the registered aspect from here. It's now uh, over uh, basically uh, almost. 15 years now, which has come out. It's very small, it's that piece of there. The part about this is that you have to suture. You make a four millimeter away from the lipids, you make a four millimeter a bridge there, and you suture into the sclera using proline, which is aspect. And it's staying there for two and a half years, as aspect from there. It worked quite well um, with this, but again, as we mentioned, it has a very um, high uh, rate of intraocular pressure, hypertension, and glaucoma. So basically, Sometimes you do that, you also do put in a, a, a tube at the same time too, with this aspect. Nowadays, how many of you have heard of something called uh, the dual suit? How many of you have heard of Illuvian? What's Illuvian? Okay, and what's the difference between Illuvian and Redisert? So, Redisert is a surgical procedure that we have to take the patient to the OR, make the incision, suture it in. It's like in there, that big. The, the Illuvian, which is the, uh, the trade name for actually fluosinolone acetonide, but it's only 0 .2, uh, uh, 21, 0 0.21 milligram, whereas the Redisert is 0.59 milligram. So, the Illuvian has the fluosinolone, but in a much smaller amount, it, but it's a procedure where you inject it in the office. So, just like the Ocidec, you inject it, but the Ocidec usually lasts about four months of the dexamethasone implant. The Alluvian uh, is currently approved for diabetic macular edema, refractory diabetic macular edema. Uh, in Europe, they're going for the indication of um, uveitis. In the United States, the study using the uh, fluosinolone acetonide as an injection, not the insert, just shows a positive uh, result, so they are going for approval. So hopefully in the future, we have fluosinolone at a much less concentration, but it's approved for UVI, it's hopefully in the future for that. Okay. So the, but we know that fluosinolone worked quite well because in the study, very impressive result, uh, well controlled information, it's just that the injury pressure is very, um, very high in this aspect. So in this the register in there, as you can see from the bottom, we make the incision, we put the implant in and we suture it up. It there is this, um, it's kind of the same group of people who, who create the, what, anybody heard something called vitrosur? Anyone heard what the vitrosur is or know what a vitrosur is? The vitrosur is the term that nowadays we don't see the disease anymore. So, vitrosur is the implant from the same group, Savita, that discovered, but is contained in Cyprovir. So at the height of the AIDS epidemic, with the most common type of infection in the eye for patients with AIDS is what? CMV. So CMV retinitis, at the height of that era, in addition to treating with systemic, which is not so effective, we put this uh, vitrosur in there. So it, I want to share with you, so in case if you read about read history, you will see that it lasts for about six months in the eye. And in the past, in the past, we put like one or two, but then at that time, patients uh, die quick, quickly, so you don't see them. But then with the advance of the heart era, patient live longer, so sometimes some of the later patients will put six or seven of those in there to control that. So vitrosurge is the, um, is the photic encyclopedia. The registers is this aspect from the, from the same group that produced this implant we put in there. And so they definitely show the difference, but the problem is that the pressure is the major headache. So we want to always expose the patient to that. And then this is a slide that we say here on the, the that lead to the dexamethasone implant that lead to its approval. The Huron study that was conducted showed approval of that for the UVX fund here. The macledema certainly can be an important component with this, as an so we can use it. Um, macledema, you know, from UVX can be quite difficult to manage. 
can we use both non-steroid and steroid to treat with that. We also at time use uh, exeduzolamide to help with this aspect because I can deal easily with direct macrodema, but that's much easier to deal with. UVA macrodema is a big headache and thick headache because it's not easy to treat them, especially when the inflammation is under control and all you have left is the macrodema. Because a lot of times, even some of these anti-vegetal agents like bevacizumab or flipocept, we cannot use it to treat it. So we try different aspects from there that we can do. Now, uh, just some update this aspect here. This was some of the recently completed study in uveitis. The visual study, because it's now at the little map, at our colleague from, from Singapore just mentioned, is now approved in certain part of the world to treat uveitis. This is the tenor alpha inhibitor to both the visual one and visual two. The stop uveitis that we published, that's because of this map, which is the IL6 inhibitor, show also very nicely result, given with that aspect from there. And we use that now in a number of cases that are not uh, responding to steroid alone. And then the, the same and the study in the Sakura, this are looking at intravitreal serolimus. So we finished the Sakura 1 and Sakura 2. The third Sakura phase is on board, about to start right now. So hopefully in the future we will have serolimus, which is a M2 inhibitor, as a locally deliverer of the eye. So the, the, the third phase 3 is about to start um, very shortly in the US now with that. So surgical therapy, the vitro retinal surgery is important, especially when you have like hemorrhages and so on, when you treat that vitreous hemorrhage, uh, retinal detachment, and epiretinal membrane, all of these, we need to surgically address them. But the same principle that apply just like whenever you do, whenever you consider a patient for cataract surgery for UVI, uh, that, who has uveitis, the principle is what? That we keep the eye very quiet for at least 90 days or more before we take the patient to the operating room, because otherwise it become a disaster afterward because with all the recurrent information. So the same thing happened with um, retinal surgery as well. Unless it's an emergency, we would, for example, let's say you have an epiretinal membrane, you don't want to peel that membrane until the eye is quiet already because otherwise you have a lot of information that remains with that aspect. So this is my last few slides here. So we spent the last um, 45, 50 minutes or so discussed on retin retinal vasculitis. This is certainly a very devastating condition that we can see. This is a patient someone asked me before in the check yet about that. So that's the optic nerve in the check. If you don't treat it correctly, it's all pale and this. So that's when the patient loses vision. Part of the aspect is often threatening their vision threatening from this. And the more important thing is that in about 20% of the cases or so, it may indicate the presence of the underlying disease that we are worried about. We don't want to lose that aspect from there. And then an ophthalmologist, a people who care of this patient, Hopefully, we can make the right diagnosis to help with this with that, because from that, not only that you preserve the vision, hopefully you also preserve the patient's life as well, too, because you're the one who made that diagnosis uh, from there. Okay? That's the end of this talk on the retinal vasculitis, and uh, now we can open up for questions. Anybody else? Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. you yeah. You, you mentioned very early on in the talk that on Oculus White Field, you often see this leaky vessels from the... From yes. the I've seen a lot of them. So, so the question is, um, for a patient with uh, a lot of time when you use the wide angle, you see the presence of leakage in the periphery. So you have to judge them. For example, if you have only a unilateral finding and the other eye is completely clean, one eye have a lot of leakage, that in my opinion is of concern. Because obviously that could not be incidental in general for that aspect. If you see bilateral and it's way in the periphery, I take a note of that. I don't necessarily make a treatment decision based that yet. I follow the patient. If in six months or so, or three months or four months, they show progression, then that's evidence for that. But just the presence of the vascular leakage in the peripheral retina, peripheral, not posterior, by a cell, would do anything else, no macrodema. I don't necessarily start a treatment of the patient because obviously any treatment comes with, with the side effects that go along with that. So you don't want that to happen. But if it's unilateral and it's there, then definitely a concern, and especially a progression for that. Question? So can I just ask about the uh, timing of uh, the basal photocoagulation for the vasculitis cases when you get ischemia? So in, in some cases, like you, when you come in, you have active vascular sheathing and you have areas of capillary lung perfusion. Um, do you do the laser photocoagulation immediately? Because does that, is that a concern that if you do a laser, does that drive the inflammation? Or do you quieten the inflammation first before you do laser? So, so I would approach it. I no, I would approach it. I would actually control the inflammation first. The presence of peripheral ischemia alone 
would not be an indication for me to do a PRP. And why do I say that? I usually require to see NV. I draw my spin based on the fact when I treat patients with vein occlusion, for example, we have done study and other group have done as well to, to look at patients with RVO. And by doing just the peripheral, when you see ischemia, you just go and do PRP, it has not made a change in the course of the need for, for endovascular treatment and so on, and deep complication. So if you see some NV, then definitely, yes, you should do PRP. Otherwise, as you already suggested, let's try to control the underlying inflammation first. In this type of cases, because there's an underlying cause that lead to that presence. So therefore, I, I would do what you suggest in the red and the PRP in the right way in that. Question? Anything else? Yes, sir. During the residency, I saw Chris and initially I diagnosed it as uh, hypertensive retinopathy, but the patient had concomitant SLE actually. So in SLE, the fraction of also patient has raised hyperte uh, hypertension. So is there any uh, uh, clue to diagnose it uh, as a SLE retinopathy or a hypertensive retinopathy? Sure, so that's a good question. So why do patients with SLE have hypertension? Because of tephropathy, uh, oh, right. chronic... Uh, of nephropathy, yeah. right? So definitely, so patients with SME can have if the kidneys involved would have that. So normally, over normally, just an idiopathic hypertensive retinopathy, you don't need, you don't see nephropathy. So you would not see proteinuria, you would not see cranial chain at the later stage. So in that type of patient, if initially all you see is just the change in the blood pressure that really high, like you know, 250 over 130 or something like that, then yes, I would say in that case control the blood pressure first unless you see other signs. Because as the case I showed you in there, the patient that have the SME, they also have renal involvement too. So now you see that, then I would say that is mean that there's an other disease in that case SME that cause both the nephropathy and the hypertension that do that. In which case you want to treat the underlying cause rather than just deal with the sign. But if you if all you see in that patient is just an elevated pressure with no other finding that I think that the easiest part and safer way would go step by step, let's control the hyperpressure again. And that's often the case too. So uh, when I first started um, Palo Alto just a year ago, one of the outside physicians referred in the patient just like that. And our fellow pretty much missed it because the diagnosis coming in is the case of uveitis. So he keep going on with all his uveitis. So when I look at this, I saw some accident, I saw him cut one spot and I say, okay, what is the blood pressure of this patient? And that's when you find out that's actually due to hypertension, and people miss that. So your point is well taken. That let's look at the thing first. If there's no other underlying disease, uh, suggestion for a systemic disease, then treat that. What we know. Good. So far, so good. Okay. My my question always is: When do we stop uh, treatment? Do we angiographically, when you think uh, there is no leakage or no vitreous cells, and the vision? I, I think if there is no macular edema, vision is six, six, and all. But what is your indicator that, okay, you've given treatment for three years, four years, two years, when do we stop treatment in a patient with retinal vascular? So I use the FA as a very good marker to follow in this. And if the patient happens, let's say if the patient has an unlike disease that gives you, let's say, low complement to begin with or very high anchor to begin with, you would treat, and the complement level and also the anchor level, you will see that they will improve with treatment. So the anchor will go down, the CLP will go down, for example, for anchor definitely, the, the complement level will go up again. So when you see the good response in that, um, and also the leakage improve, I would then stop. So in general, I like to treat this patient, and certainly it's very, but usually for this type, I aim for about 18 to 24 months of treatment for this aspect, until you see that it's well resolved. Especially like, for example, in children, I do them, I follow them, because let's say you start with infliximab, right? So you start with a dose, let's say, five milligram per kilogram for infliximab. You want to see how they respond. After three months, after six months, you don't see much improvement. You don't want to keep at that dose. You have to increase it higher to either seven and a half or ten milligrams per kilogram to treat that type of patient. And then you see how they respond. Once they start to improve, that is when you start counting. Okay, now I want to treat it enough so that our goal in DVIS when we use IMT is to put the disease into remission so that way they will be able to, to, to um, control the disease. So Dr. Rupesh asked that question and it's very important. Definitely, it's not a three or four month treatment. Uh, usually, it's a long term treatment for this because you want to put the disease into remission so that they won't put it. 
Unfortunately, at this stage, we cannot quote unquote cure the disease yet because we don't know what the disease is yet completely many times, but we want to put into remission for that. But you definitely use some marker. You have to be able to see something, either the flow scene or some biomarker to, to follow this patient. And uh, maybe one last question by the professor, Dr. Dr. Ho. Yeah, Dr. Ho, no, no, why? Sorry, um, I just want to ask one question because at the moment, I, I personally, I use a lot of MK. And um, my hospital is now asking us to use a substitute called Ramsimum, which is a biosimilar of, uh, of infliximab. I was wondering whether you have any experience with that. <laughs> Yes, so interesting you ask. Um, at San Francisco Airport, while I was waiting for the plane to get here, our fellow sent me a note and said that um, the, <laughs> the insulin just asked for that aspect from there. So it is in fact a, a, a biosimilar. That is one biosimilar. I know, for example, um, the company Samsung from Korea is making another biosimilar on, on Infliximab as well. The experience with that so far, at least in like, um, Crohn disease, for example, when they use that, seem to be similar. I have to say that if I have myself start just now begin to use it, so I can tell you, let's say in a year from now, when I come back next year, can tell you how they do it, this thing, but I don't have yet the good answer because this biologic, just uh, this biosimilar just started to come apart. And I suspect that it will be so good because that one just came on board. Same as I was doing, uh, I have one, another one coming up right now. Interestingly enough, the dose is similar. They also start out with like five milligram, going up to ten milligram as well. So it's very similar. That's why I, I don't know how it go. But but in some patients, I do know that the, the, the generic is not doing so well. For example, Michael Fenley Bonfitil, I like to use the, the brand name Salsa. So when I use Salsa, I have seen the difference between that versus the the um, uh, the generic like microfolic acid or, or microfenolate, for example, that one. The other example which I see is that in um, new, new sporin, um, um as well for that, for example. So cyclosporin, sorry, cyclosporin for, for, um, for neural. So when I use neural, uh, I use it at a lower dose and it seems to be much better effect rather compared to when I use a generic cyclosporin. So, that, so you can see and see how it goes. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Maybe we'll thank Professor Kwan for this uh, exciting talk on retinal vasculitis and we'll get uh, Professor Vishali Gupta again here and uh, to present on infective uveitis part one. And part two will be covered by... Part two. Uh, oh, sorry. Part is already covered by the whole of the Yeah, sorry. Part two and uh, posterior.